Good morning. Welcome to our service. It's good to have you joining us this, e this morning online here at our service at New Life Church in Toulon, Manitoba. Thank you for watching and we pray that uh, the service today might minister to your needs uh, as we look at God's Word and we worship together and uh, uh, we fellowship in this way. We just commit this service now to the Lord with prayer and would you join me as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to worship you this way. We ask that through this service, everything that is said and done may bring glory and honor to you. We thank you for your uh, goodness and, and grace and mercy to us for sending Jesus into this world to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins. And now we pray that uh, everything that is said in this service truly may glorify you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Church secretaries are an interesting bunch. I like this cartoon in which uh, uh, has the guy asking the church secretary do, and she says to him, do you want to speak to the boss or to someone who knows what she's talking about? Well, here at New Life Church, we are blessed to have a secretary. Actually, we call her the office administrator here is Debbie Chartrand and uh, she's just a wonderful, does a wonderful job here at the church. We sure, sure appreciate the work she does. She puts out a uh, bi-weekly uh, church newsletter and uh, we she uh, puts it together she runs it off and also emails it and does a super great job <clears throat> and uh, you perhaps may be wondering why I am referring to uh, church secretaries as I'm beginning my message on the topic of hell and um, I think the reason you will soon see uh, but first I want to uh, just show you couple of bloopers, church bulletin bloopers that uh, secretaries through the years have done. Now, unfortunately, Debbie never makes any mistakes, but there are, are secretaries who have made bloopers, and I want to share some of these. These, these some of them are, are really quite funny. Here's one that uh, announced, ladies, don't forget the rubbish sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping. Don't forget your husband. And then here's another one. Don't forget the elections for head deacon and dead deaconess will be held at next month's business meeting. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. Tonight's sermon, searching for Jesus. Uh, ushers will eat latecomers. Uh, there will be no moms who care this week. Then uh, please welcome Pastor Don, a caring man who loves hurting people. Uh, for those of you who have children and don't know, do we have a nursery downstairs? Sermon outline, A, Delineate your fear. B, disown your fear. C, displace your rear. Um, there will be, there will not be any women worth watching this week. The Reverend Mary Weather spoke briefly, much to the delight of the audience. Evening massage, 6 p.m. Congratulations to Tim and Rhonda on the birth of their daughter, October 12th through 17th. Now that was a long uh, labor and delivery. I think it was great. Uh, smile at someone who is hard to love. Say hell to someone who doesn't care much about you. And then the last one. At the evening service tonight, the sermon will be, What is hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. Well, those last two bloopers uh, in the bulletin, of course, uh, involving the word hell, lead into what I want to talk about this morning. And uh, today we are resuming our series on the book of 1 Peter, and I'm going to look at a very interesting text that seems to suggest that Jesus went to hell. And particularly, it's related between his death on the cross and three days later, his resurrection from the dead. The Apostles' Creed is a second century uh, baptismal um, uh, 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 commissioning uh, type of, uh, it's a creed that was put together in the second century uh, when people were getting baptized and uh, commonly recited in many churches and uh, I want to read it here this morning. It goes like this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord, who was con conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Well, in that Apostles' Creed, I want you to notice the statement there, he descended into hell. He descended into hell. And so this phrase actually comes from the text we are looking at this morning, and that's 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. And this is the way that our text reads this morning. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And so this morning I've entitled my message, Did Jesus Go to Hell Between His Death and Resurrection? And as we prepare to uh, look at this, let's pray first. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God. And there are uh, certain passages that sometimes can be a little bit difficult to understand. And as we dig into this one this morning, we pray that your spirit will guide and lead us and help us to understand exactly what it means, what this verse is talking about how Jesus descended into hell, what that exactly means, uh, both in the scripture and to us today in our personal lives. And we pray that through your spirit, we will all be strengthened in our faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who died on the cross for our sins, so we could be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. We thank you for all these wonderful blessings. And I stand against all the forces of darkness and command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. And Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Come in, minister to us, guide and lead us into the truth. Before we pray this in Jesus' name, for his honor and glory, amen. When I was a student in Bible college, uh, I was traveling home one weekend from uh, the Bible college where I was attending, Miller Memorial Bible Institute in Pembroke, Saskatchewan. And I drove past a service station in Carlisle, Saskatchewan, uh, that uh, caused me, when I went past that service station, to back up, get my camera, and take a picture. And this is the picture that I took. It was the Shell station there, and the Carlisle Motors in Carlisle, and you see the S had fallen off, and it simply said, Carlisle Motors Limited, Hell. And I remember thinking, whoa, did I go too far on this trip? Have I <laughs> gone a greater distance than uh, I was anticipating to? Um, well, we, we, we can laugh and uh, make jokes, but in reality, um, hell is a very real and awful place. It's interesting, I find, that uh, a majority of people today say they do believe in the existence of hell. A recent survey uh, showed that 60% of people say they believe there is a hell. And uh, my suggestion is apparently many more do if you listen to some of their language in particular. Uh, they're constantly using um, uh, hell in their profanity, like go to hell and what the, what the hell and that sort of uh, phraseology. Uh, you know, do you ever wonder why it is that non-Christian people tend to use biblical language when they use profanity, when they swear? Well, why is it? Uh, that they're always using words from the Bible, you know, like uh, holy this and holy that, or uh, they'll even use the name of Jesus Christ, or they'll damn this or damn that. It, it's very common. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me why those words seem to be the ones people use in profanity. Well, hell is one of the words that's used uh, in profanity, as you can see, as obviously you've heard many people use it through the years. Now, when we talk about people believing in hell, a lot of people are thinking that hell is going to be for them one great big party. And there is a uh, opinion, I've had people tell me, I'm going to hell, but that's not going to be so bad. Um, all my friends will be there. It's going to be one great big party, like this meme someone has put together. Hell is where the party is at, all the fun people will be there. George Bernard Shaw said, and I quote, hell won't be so bad because all the interesting people will be there. And many people think that and uh, are fearful or worried about having to uh, experience eternal uh, damnation and hell. 
A number of years ago, as I was pastoring the church in Stonewall, uh, I received a letter from one of the boys in Sunday school. It was just before Christmas, and this is what he wrote. He wrote, Dear Pastor Henry, thank you for being my pastor. Thank you for teaching me about Jesus. He helps me every day. I like Sunday school. I like Mr. Deering as my teacher. And then he goes on to say an interesting statement. Notice what he says. At my school, there are kids who actually want to go to hell. I pray for them every night. I wish you and Mrs. Ozerny a Merry Christmas. Love, Robert. And Robert was uh, at this time probably a seven, maybe eight year old boy. And uh, I saved that letter. It, it meant so much to me. Um, and the tragic statement there, you see what he says about kids in grade two, grade three, saying they want to go to hell. Well, instead of hell being one great big party, it's actually not going to be that. It's going to be a place of eternal separation from God and indeed from everyone else. Now, a basic uh, definition of hell is this. Hell is separation from God. Matthew 25, 30 says, And throw that worthless servant outside, and Jesus is making this statement, into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. It's not a party. And if you are been thinking it's a party it's not going to be a party um, for sure now the difference I want to say this between heaven and hell is that heaven will be community and hell will be isolation that's the difference some time ago I was visiting a lady in uh, Stonewall in her home and her husband had just passed away and she was not a believer and I I got, had known the family and I stopped in to visit with her during her time of grieving. And uh, she made a very interesting statement to me that particular visit. She said to me, you know, Pastor Henry, I want to go to hell because I want to be reunited with my husband. And I know that that's where he went when he died. And uh, he was not a professing believer at, even to the point of his death. And she made that statement. And I remember uh, thinking as she said that to me, oh, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. Happen. There's no reunions in hell. There will be reunions in heaven. Your loved ones have died and gone on to heaven. You will see them again. You will visit with them. You'll talk with them. You'll spend eternity with them. But hell is a place of isolation. In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis describes hell as a lonely gray town. And it's trapped kind of in the twilight. And the houses are built a huge distance from one another. And the people are find, finding themselves constantly moving further and further away from each other. It's kind of like the expanding universe. And that's the way Lewis in The Great Divorce describes hell. Well, when Jesus hung on the cross, he experienced that separation. You see, for someone who had never known even a moment separation from his father, he now felt completely abandoned by God as he hung there on the cross. Matthew 27, 46, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that experience that Jesus went through separation from God was what we would call hell. Now, the difference between the rest of us as humans and Jesus is this, that Jesus as a infinite being experienced hell for a finite period of time. He was uh, on the cross uh, and uh, separated from God uh, for a period of six hours from the time he was crucified till he actually died. And we as humans, as finite beings, will experience hell for an infinite period of time, forever and ever and ever. And so that is the difference between Christ's experience of hell on the cross and those of human beings separated from Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior because of their sin. Now the great agony of Jesus on the cross was, phys was not physical, well, for sure it was that. We won't minimize that, but it was actually more what we call emotional. It was the experience of rejection by God. 
The psalmist put it as a prophecy in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Actually, those were the words Jesus actually said when he was hanging on the cross. Why are you so far from saving me? Uh, so far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night. And I am not silent. You see, that is so often true. It's easier to endure physical pain than it is to endure emotional pain. The emotional pain that comes when somebody you love deeply rejects you. When you experience humiliation and people make fun of you and such. I'll never forget one evening many years ago as I was in uh, a meeting in uh, my office at the church and um, we were dealing with a situation of infidelity in a particular uh, uh, couple at the church and the wife who was the victim of her husband's unfaithfulness was in deep anguish of soul and I'll never forget when she stood up and screamed at the top of her voice, I'm in hell! She said, and the, her, the rending in her heart of what she was going through. Well, that's the emotional pain of hell. But you see, hell was never created by God for people. It was originally made for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, Jesus said, then he will say to those on his, on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire. And notice I italicized the next phrase. Prepared for the devil and his angels. God never prepared hell for people. He prepared it for the devil and his angels. And that's their ultimate destiny. Revelation 20. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The beast, of course, is the Antichrist. The false prophet is his right hand. Uh, a worker, and the three of them are the, what we call the satanic trinity. And so that's the eternal destiny of hell, and that's why God created hell. It wasn't for you and I as people or any human being. It was created for the devil and his angels. Now, some of you maybe struggle with um, uh, conflict with the devil, and uh, one of the issues that I find that uh, a lot of Christians struggle with is battling the accusations of Satan against them in creating guilt in their lives for sins that they've committed in the past who asked for and received forgiveness, but Satan keeps reminding them about it. He's called the accuser of the brethren, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Now, here's a statement that I want you to remember, that when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. I do that all the time. And I quote that verse from uh, back there, Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. And whenever I battle with Satan, I always remind him that. That's your eternal destiny. And uh, it's a constant, he needs that constant reminder in your spiritual warfare uh, against Satan. Now the point is that God wants no one to go to hell. First Timothy 2, 4. God wants all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3 9, God is not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Ezekiel 18 23, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. As a matter of fact, the reason Jesus came and died on the cross was so we wouldn't have to go to hell. I oftentimes make this, this statement, God truth. God sends no one to hell. People choose to go there. It's not God's choice. It's not God's will. It's ultimately your choice by saying no to Jesus. Well, in our text, it goes on to say that Jesus was put to death in the, in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. And let me read it to you here out of, uh, of uh, 1 Peter uh, 3.18. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, when it talks about the fact that he was made alive by the Spirit, this, of course, refers, as you would understand it, to his resurrection. And uh, the fact that Jesus, on the third day, rose from the dead. One of the highlights of my 
ministry career over the years has been to go to Israel. I've been there 21 times over the years, and I thoroughly enjoy each time we go the opportunity to visit the garden tomb. Picture of Linda, my wife, and myself in a recent trip there standing in front of the tomb where many scholars believe that Jesus died, uh, was buried, and rose, or was buried and rose again from. Well, this passage in 1 Peter 3 is saying the resurrection was empowered by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 11, Paul writes, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. And so this is what our text in verse 19 says. It's by that same Holy Spirit that then Jesus went and preached to the Spirit's in prison, as verse 19 puts it here in our text, uh, through whom, well, I'll pick it up earlier on, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. And so this is where the Apostles' Creed gets that statement, he descended into hell, from this statement, through whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison. And this is the the, uh, the a scriptural basis for this theological phrase, he descended into hell. It's found in the Apostles' Creed, uh, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now it goes on to say uh, that that prison that Jesus went to, he preached to spirits. So the question is, who are these spirits in prison? And the answer is that they were spir these spirits were angels who disobeyed God in those days. And in our text it says, who, who disobeyed long ago, actually let me uh, pick up the uh, context in verse 19. Uh, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And so what you have here is these spirits were actually the angels that in Genesis are called the sons of God. And that's the passage I had Emily read for us earlier on. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, it says, And the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Now the question is, who are these sons of God? There are some scholars who believe that sons of God are the descendants of the line of, of, uh, of Abel, um, no, of Seth, I should say, rather, and uh, the daughters of men are the descendants of the line of Cain, the two remaining uh, sons of Adam and Eve. And the, the line of uh, Seth was the godly line, the line of Cain was the ungodly line. Uh, and there's a possibility of that. The position I take is that these are actually uh, angels, and I'll show you why I believe that as we, we go through this. Now, how did these angels disobey God? Well, as sons of God, it says they cohabitated with human women. Genesis 6, 2, of whom they married any of them whom they chose. So they saw the daughters of men were beautiful and they married them. So what you have here was essentially a crossing of boundary lines between the spirit world and the human world. And that was the great sin of that day. That's why Jude verse 6 commenting on this says, These are the angels who didn't keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their assigned place. They didn't remain in the rightful role as angels, but they ended up engaging in this illicit activity. And this intermingling of the spirit world and the human world is not something that's unknown today. Um, in the occult, it's called incubus and succubus. Now, if you don't know anything about this, I want to say that's really, really good. Uh, because uh, this is a kind of piece of information that really, um, I'd rather not know anything about myself. You know, where I would think ignorance is bliss. That this is the depths of the sin of human nature and the demonic world. That's why in Romans 16, verse 19, it says, I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. But I throw it in, that don't, don't spend much time thinking on this because this is a very dark part of human reality. Well, that union of spirit and human produced what Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 calls the Nephilim. 
And uh, the word Nephilim can be actually translated as giants. Genesis 6, 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children of them. These were the mighty men, the men of renown, mighty men and the men of renown. Now, there's a lot of speculation out there as to what exactly these Nephilim were, what they were like. And um, if you Google uh, the uh, word Nephilim, you'll get pictures like this, the idea of this human uh, giants, and that's why the word Nephilim can be translated as giant. And in some way, and I don't understand this, and I'll leave it just at this statement and nope, I'll move on. They, I tend to believe they must have been some sort of super race. And because of this sin, it was that these angels were then condemned to this prison. Jude verse 6, he held angels for judgment on the great day. They were held in darkness, bound by eternal chains. And then the world itself was deluged by the flood. For God did, uh, 2 Peter uh, 2, 4 and 5, For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. He did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on the ungodly people, but protected Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and seven others. And it was this great sin that led God to the decision to destroy all humankind in the flood in Noah's day. Well, it's to these spirits that Jesus then went and declared his final victory. And that's what I believe what it was. He went and preached to the spirits in prison, meaning in the word there is kleruzo literally means made proclamation. It wasn't a preaching like I'm doing, expecting a response. It's a declaration. Here's an announcement. And the announcement essentially, as you've seen, I put it there, uh, guys, guess what? You've lost. The game is over. That's what it was. They were told you're on the losing side. And I want to say that that victory of Christ is available to us. And I want to look at that victory of Christ and how it impacts us today. And I want to suggest to you that because of Christ's death, we can have victory in three parts of our lives. And the first part is because of Christ's death, we can have victory over our past. We can be victorious over the penalty of our sin that would eternally condemn us to hell. And you see, because Jesus died on the cross, my past can be forgiven. My conscience can be cleared. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, through the eternal spirit, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences? from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. What a wonderful truth it is there when it talks about cleansing our conscience. How many people battle with a guilty conscience for the things they did in their past? And for some of you who are older, as young people, things you did that you're ashamed of now, you wouldn't want anybody to know about it. It's kind of hidden in the dark corners of your heart. Everybody's got a secret closet like that in their lives. And the wonderful thing is, through Jesus' death, the victory out of his death is the cleansing of our consciences. Our Daily Bread is a wonderful daily devotional booklet. I highly recommend everybody using it as part of their uh, uh, devotional life. It's uh, a passage of scripture that uh, is dealt with, and a poem, and a story. It's really well done. And uh, uh, Radio Bible Fast puts it out. Some time ago, a lady wrote into Daily Bread and said these words, I am 88 years old and I can recall past thoughts and actions. Now I have the opportunity to clear them with my Lord. It feels good to know I'm forgiven. Well, obviously, uh, she was preparing for death. So that's good to know. All those bad things I did when I was a younger person and cleansed. And I want to say to this, to you this morning, how wonderful it is to know that the guilt of your sins is gone. If indeed you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you have opened the door of your heart and asked Him to come in. And that God does not hold those things against you anymore. Those things that you did, which were wrong. Psalm 32, verse 1, David writes after committing a sin with Bathsheba, What happiness for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joys when sins are covered over. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared 
their record. And my hope for you is that you this morning may know the joy of having your sins forgiven today. What a wonderful thing. Somebody has put it this way, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Isn't that wonderful? Secondly, we can have victory over our present. We can be victorious over the battles of daily life or our daily pro problems. And I would suggest to you this is particularly re relevant today where many people are struggling with the effects of the ongoing pandemic and the various COVID related issues. It's interesting just to do a little bit of research online and some of the um, news items uh, dealing with the struggles people are having today relating to COVID-19. Uh, here's this uh, article, COVID-19's widespread impact on mental health. A share of adults who experience stress, anxiety, or sadness, it was difficult to cope with alone during the pandemic. United States, 33%, Canada, 26%. Another one, 46% of people in Canada are experiencing anxiety or worry due to COVID-19. Chapman University in their National COVID-19 and Mental Health Survey, based on a national survey with 4,149 respondents, 61% of people surveyed were feeling more stress, 60% feeling more nervous, anxious, on edge, 39% were eating more than normal, 47% were feeling trapped at home. Um, in the Zurich study, early lockdown studies found that up to 37% found signs of psychological distress and up to 45% of adults felt adverse effects on mental health and up to 70% felt this period was the most stressful of their careers. That's, that's the, the emotional struggles, the stress that a lot of people are going through. Financial struggles as well. Um, the uh, National Endowment for Financial Education uh, did a survey and uh, they talked about the stress and people, notice the middle one, they're stressed now. Almost 90% of people are stressed when it comes to finances. And uh, just a tiny bit lower there, probably about 85 or not, maybe even a bit more, um, concerned about next year in their finances. And then you have the things like being uh, con uh, challenged by isolation. 37% of people who tested positive for COVID-19 reported that self-isolation had a negative impact on their well-being and mental health. And then you have things like health issues do, uh, caused by delayed treatments and, and, and surgeries. Um, news reports here uh, of all the various things and you, you, some of you perhaps have been impacted in this. Uh, I've talked to people who are still waiting for hip replacements and such and Somebody said they had an appointment uh, this past week and uh, didn't work out and tried to reschedule their appointment and they said it won't be till March now. And, and the delays in, in healthcare, and that's producing stress on people. Four in 10 US adults reported avoiding medical care because of concerns related to COVID-19. They wouldn't go to the hospital, wouldn't go to doctors. And then on top of that, you have increasing substance abuse. 31% increase in alcohol consumption as a result of the pandemic. 29% increase in other drug use. Um, suicides, emergency department visits for unsuspected, for suspected suicide attempts amongst US girls ages 12 to 19 have increased during the COVID pandemic. 51% uh, over the same period for February, March of 2019 to 2021. And then you have violence, uh, violence against women and girls uh, uh, and COVID-19. Globally, 243 million women and girls aged 15 to nine, uh, 49 have been subjected to violence in the previous 12 months. What a tragedy. But I want to say this, folks. Because of Jesus's victory, we can manage these present problems, whatever they may be. Psalmist, uh, the psalmist put it this way in Psalm 55, I call to God and, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. Ephesians 3.16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. 1 Peter 5.7, casting all your care on him for he cares for you. Psalm 55, 2, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. 
Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I want to suggest to you that if you're struggling with COVID-related concerns, or any other worries for that matter, you need to do this this morning. Cast those cares on Jesus. We used to sing a song, leave your, oh, I don't know if I should try singing it, I'll just give you the words. Leave your heavy burden at the cross and go free, O oh, sinner, go free. Leave your heavy burden at the cross and go free, O oh, sinner, go free. Leave your burden at the cross. I came across an article by Stephanie King. My faith is what's helping me through this pandemic. And she puts it this way in her blog. I'm not here to Bible thump, but to share my own journey to faith. Once I decided I would hold God's scripture in my life front and center, I began to look at this passage of, of the Bible differently. Now that has helped me understand that this novel coronavirus doesn't get the final say, God does. That even I, if I cannot see it or fully comprehend it, that even if I cannot see it or fully comprehend it, God is working out all things for a greater good. And it's possible some things aren't even meant for me to fully grasp on this side of eternity. The thing is, we all worship or idolize something. For some, it might not be God or religion at all, but leisure or financial security or loved ones or health or career. She concludes, she says, whatever your relationship is with faith, I hope I can encourage you to consider that we were made for much more than what this virus can take from us. For me, at least, it's faith that's holding me together as I rock my daughter to sleep each night, silently praying for a better tomorrow for all of us. And that's the third part. We have victory over the future through the victory of Christ. And we need not have anxiety over what the future may hold for us, whether they be things like health problems, financial struggles, family difficulties, personal concerns, and more COVID mutations. And I love what Paul writes in Romans 8, 37 to 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, COVID-19 will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful truth. And for sure, we do not have to fear death. Hebrews 9.27 says everyone must die once and after that be judged by God. But that fear of death is something that runs so many people's lives. It says in Hebrews 2.15 that those who have lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. It's so interesting that I find when I talk to people about death, so oftentimes you find them just kind of changing the subject. They're uncomfortable. They want to talk about that. But Jesus' purpose for coming was to set us free from the fear of death. And that's why it says in Hebrews 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. You know, the great slavery of the fear of death. And Jesus defeated death. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 15, then the saying that is written will come, true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful truth. Well, because of the victory of Christ, the three things can be true in our lives. My past can be forgiven, my present can be managed, and my future can be guaranteed. And I ask this question as I conclude. Have you experienced these victories in your life? I trust you have, and that if not, you will. And as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we got, the victory through Christ because he died, went to hell, was buried, went to hell, rose again the third day and has provided all this for us. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus coming into this world, dying on the cross and paying the penalty for our sins. Thank you because of that that our past can be forgiven, our present can be managed, and our future is guaranteed. What a wonderful promise it is. We thank you so much. We bless you for that. And this morning, as we conclude, I'll give you just a moment just to consider um, what this means in your life personally. If you have not had your sins yet forgiven, or there's an issue of guilt, bring them to the cross of Christ and receive his forgiveness of you. Just ask him to come into your life, forgive your sins, 
become your Savior. Dear Lord, you can pray something like this. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sins. Become my Savior. Or there's a, a sin you're engaging in now. Confess that to him now. And ask for his forgiveness. And surrender to his holiness in your life. Let him guide and lead you through the temptations. And then if you're anxious and worried, I urge you this morning, leave your burden at the cross. Whatever you're bearing, the struggle, leave it with him. Walk out of this service with a sense of peace and freedom. And look forward to eternity in heaven with Jesus as a result. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your many goodnesses to us. Bless us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.